Welcome to the Sonosite webinar today on ultrasound guided regional anesthesia for hip surgery. Before we begin, please be advised all attendees are muted. You may type your questions into the Q&A box in the toolbar located at the bottom or side of your screen at any time. We will conduct a Q&A session at the end of the presentation and live demo. This webinar will be recorded and archived for future reference. With us today, we have Dr. Richard Teams. Dr. Teams is a dedicated anesthesiologist with a unique background in nursing who excels in working with trauma and critical care patients. He trained at the busiest trauma center in the US and has exceptional regional skills and ultrasound technique in multiple nerve block modalities. He is currently the director of regional anesthesia at John Peter Smith Hospital, as well as national clinical director of regional anesthesia at Envision Physician Services. Dr. Teams is an officer in the United States Army Reserve Medical Corps his clinical interests include acute pain management, regional anesthesia, advanced airway techniques, and cardiovascular anesthesia. He has a genuine interest and enthusiasm for teaching clinical and acute pain regional anesthesia and is a bilingual English-Spanish patient advocate. Thank you so much for being here today with, with us, Dr. Teams. And with that, I will turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Laura. It's very nice to be with you. And Good afternoon and good evening to everybody. I'm really happy to, to be here to, to do this next series in the behind the scan. Today we're going to be talking uh, a lot about uh, hip uh, procedures, hip fractures, and also uh, hip arthroplasties, and how to do really good regional anesthesia for these types of procedures. Uh, there's some other uh, types of procedures that also kind of falls into the category of the blocks that we're talking about, and I'll try to highlight them here uh, today. Uh, so without further ado, let's kind of go into this and we're going to do some live scanning and we're going to do um, a little bit of um, um, education on particularly two, two blocks. Uh, the first is let's just go over what the options are. So historically, PO IV pain medications. Grandma falls, breaks her hips. What do we give her? We gork her out on narcotics, right? Uh, we can also do spinal anesthetics. Um, this is pretty popular throughout the United States. Um, sometimes plus or minus using Duramorph, just like in the OB population, uh, to help manage post-operative pain for hip surgeries. Um, but then we come into these other blocks, uh, fascia iliaca blocks, also known as FI blocks. So if I, if I say FI blocks, it's, I'm, I'm referring to fascia iliaca blocks. And then this newer block, which is PENG block. And I'll be talking about both of these uh, today, and I'll show you how to scan both of them and what the nuances are for each of these two different uh, nerve blocks modalities, but also when one is more um, important to use versus another, because there, there is a little bit of that. So if we look at the indications for some of these, so clearly hip surgeries, uh, femoral rods, uh, nails, uh, hardware removal, uh, hip fractures, and then even anterior lateral skin grafts can be used, particularly with the fascia iliaca block, maybe not so much for the uh, pain block. And we'll talk a little bit about that. But first, what we're going to do is I'm going to talk about the fascia iliaca block, and then we'll scan the fascia iliaca block, and then go in and do the pain block. So uh, first of all, fascia iliaca block, it's known as the three-in-one block where uh, three nerves can be uh, numbed or blocked. Uh, primarily, you've got the femoral nerve, the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. Those two nerves are pretty reliably blocked with a fascia iliaca block. The third nerve, the obturator nerve, um, may or may not get blocked. It's, um, it, sometimes it does, sometimes it's not. The, 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 uh, the amount of distance that local anesthetic has to traverse in order to get a lot of the obturator nerves, and particularly a lot of the ones that are going to be used in hip surgeries, um, may or may not get blocked, but pretty reliably, lateral femoral cutaneous and femoral nerve blocks, and those articular branches, particularly of the femoral nerve that dive deep into the hip capsule, are the ones that are going to get blocked when you do a fascia iliaca block. Okay. Um, now, fascia iliaca block is more of a high volume block. I usually use about 50 mLs, and this is an example of what you can use. So I'll dilute. Uh, 30 mLs of 0.5% ropivacaine down to 0.3%, which is basically adding 20 cc's of saline to 30 cc's of 0.5% ropivacaine, and that will give me 50 cc's total. Uh, you can also use bupivacaine. That's, a, that's another uh, good option as well. And then let's go, I'm gonna rely, I'm gonna go back to this um, slide 
uh, a second time because it's really important and critical to understand what fractures, what uh, nerve dermatomes of the femur itself uh, can and reliably get, get blocked by these various different blocks. So you have 50% um, of our uh, fractures are going to be, uh, you know, femoral neck fractures. Um, and then you have intratrochanteric uh, fractures, which makes up uh, a pretty good percent. But then you have the subtrochanteric fractures or, or more of the shaft of the femoral uh, or the, of the femur. Now, a fascia iliaca block can reliably get all three types of these fractures, okay? But a ping block, and I'm going to refer back to this again when we talk about ping block, a ping block is really only going to be pretty reliable for the first two, meaning the femoral neck or intertrochanteric uh, femoral fractures, but is not, however, going to be really effective for subtrochanteric um, femur fractures. So if you're doing like a femoral nail because they're, you know, it's a subtrochanteric fracture, you're better off doing a fascia iliaca block because of the nerve distribution of a pain block. And we're going to get into that. But uh, fascia iliaca block is going to block most of the femoral nerve, uh, including all those articular branches that dive into this proximal part of the femur um, and get all the the nerves that that uh, that innervate this part. That's why it's going to be effective for all three of these. Okay, there are clearly some limitations to doing a fascia iliaca block. One of them, if you're doing this for hip arthroplasties, uh, you know, a lot of our orthopedic surgeon colleagues really like having our patients ambulate pretty quickly after those hip arthroplasties. Well, if you do a fascia iliaca block, um, you know, you are getting the femoral nerve, and so because you're getting the femoral nerve, you're going to get those the quad weakness that comes along with it, which can be a limiting factor for doing a lot of PT after after surgery. Um, so that's one of the limitations for fascia iliaca block. Uh, when we go in and talk about pain block, that's actually one of the benefits of a pain block is that you miss a lot of those um, motor neurons. And so it's kind of the, uh, if you will, the, the adductor canal block of the hip. <laughs> because with a pain block, you're, you're missing a lot of those uh, motor neurons of the femur. And we'll get into that here in a little bit. But when we talk about fascia iliaca blocks, what we're really covering, and this is how this works, if you can imagine that, uh, the, the, that syringe actually pointing uh, superiorly as opposed to where it's kind of going as a, like a, a femoral nerve block, but going superiorly, that local anesthetic will go into the iliac fossa, which is all that area that's highlighted in yellow. And what lays on top of the, the muscles there are those three nerves, particularly the femoral nerve that is coming from the, the lumbar plexus, as well as the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. All right. And that's where that's where the magic happens with this block. That's where the local anesthetic works, is it works up in the iliac fossa. Even though we're injecting more caudally, if you inject it, uh, if you aim it uh, superior medially, it's going to, that local anesthetic is going to go up towards that iliac fossa and get those nerves. Now, I really like this cartoon kind of showing a little bit of what the anatomy is here. So you have the muscle that's just at the bottom here, um, which is the iliacus muscle. And then to the right, you obviously see the vessels and you see the femoral nerve. Well, the fascia iliaca covers the uh, iliacus muscle, and then it also covers over the top of the femoral nerve. So you can see that there's one continuous fascial plane there that is uh, continuous that encompasses where the femoral nerve is. And that's actually how you get a lot of the femoral nerve weaknesses because it is inside that fascial plane. That little muscle that's kind of poking out to the far left, that's the sartorius muscle. And we're going to be talking quite a bit about the sartorius muscle um, and using that as an anatomical landmark when we look for and we scan for this uh, nerve block. But here is another anatomy of that. You can see the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve coming off to the far left, and then you see the femoral nerve coming straight down. And then you got some of those obturator nerves uh, coming out as well. That, again, like I was saying, because of how far that local anesthetic has to traverse up the psoas muscle, um, sometimes it can be a little challenging to get the obturator nerve. So when we talk about scanning for a um, uh, fascia iliaca block, I always talk about home base, and I'll use home base, the term home base, quite a, quite a bit here because it will be the same for a pain block. 
Home base is just a place that everybody can go to that everybody's very familiar with. Everybody is very familiar with doing, for the most part, doing ephemeral nerve block. You go to the inguinal crease, um, scan medially until you see the vessels, particularly the femoral artery, and then just lateral to the femoral artery, you're going to see the femoral nerve. So from there, what you can do is scan laterally very uh, slightly. And actually, I'm going to see if I can, I'm going to use this little highlighter. Let me, let me try something here. If we can. There we go. Uh, I'm sure everybody can see my little highlighter there. So here we got our femoral artery here. We got our uh, femoral nerve. Um, and then just laterally, this little nick right here of a muscle, this is the sartorius muscle. And you can see kind of what I call the pyramid of the iliacus muscle. Uh, but just lateral to that is going to be our sartorius muscle. So from here, you can just scan, start scanning laterally until you see more and more of this sartorius muscle. When you see more and more of the sartorius muscle, what you want to do is rotate your probe until it's pointing towards the umbilicus like this. Okay. There's another scanning technique which um, doesn't use the home base, but it's basically starting from the ASIS or the um, anterior superior iliac spine coming a little bit off of it and then where the inguinal ligament is and then uh, putting your probe in this orientation and then just kind of scanning medially until you start seeing sartorius and the inter uh, um, and the inner oblique or the internal oblique muscle uh, that way it's a um, it's a uh, um, it's uh, that's the classic uh, bow tie sign that we usually uh, talk about quite a bit when we're talking about um, the fascia iliaca blocks. So this is what this kind of looks like uh, using that other cartoon superimposed on our probe here. Um, you have the um, ultrasound probe pretty much uh, bisecting the, the inguinal crease and the inguinal ligament. Um, and then our needle is going to go from caudad to cephalod aiming towards the umbilicus, which is right here. Okay. And what that does is that's going to push our local anesthetic um, cephalad. It's going to push it up into this iliac fossa, which is right here, which is where all those nerves uh, kind of live. And they're a lot more proximal there, as you can see in this image. Okay. Um, and then if you look at it, uh, it I really like this slide because it shows kind of what, what's happening here. Um, I, you put your needle, so uh, caudad is going to be the sartorius muscle, which is this muscle here. Cephalad, this is going to be our um, internal oblique muscle. And basically, my and this is the iliacus muscle uh, down below, my, lo my needle is going through the sartorius muscle, and it is going cephalad underneath this internal oblique muscle. And you can see it here uh, down below. This is kind of the, the tip of the sartorius muscle. You penetrate the sartorius muscle, you get underneath the fascia iliaca, and then you start your local infiltration, and you track your needle a little bit more uh, cephalad underneath the internal oblique muscle. So this local anesthetic is going to dive down, in, and you clearly can't see it in this image, but it's diving down into that iliac fossa, and it's getting uh, those nerves. It's basically bathing all of those nerves. Here's another cartoon showing that. So you have the needle going through. This is actually our bow tie. Um, so there's a bow. This is the tie. This is the this is the bow. Um, now I get a lot of people and I get a lot of questions about this. Like, well, I can't really see the bow tie. I can't, you know, I just it's really hard for me. You know, how how can we make this a little bit better? I'm going to talk about that here just in the next slide. But um, but this is uh, how. Uh, you know, your needle positioning should go. And I always, always, always go through the sartorius muscle and I pop out the other end of the sartorius muscle because if you do that, you're always going to be underneath the fascia iliaca and not in between it or on top of it, which is what you want to try to avoid. If you go through and through the sartorius muscle, you're almost assured to get in underneath that iliacus muscle. A lot of times people will um, get above the fascia iliaca, which uh, your block won't be very efficacious. Now this slide, I intentionally didn't label which side is caudad and which side is cephalad, okay? But this here is our iliacus muscle, okay? And this line here is our fascia iliaca. Now you can see in this image, there's two distinct bow ties. You can see this one looks like muscle. This makes, this makes a lot of sense. I can understand this is muscle. This is clearly muscle. This looks very similar. But if you go over on this side, 
This looks a little bit more schmutzy, we'll call it. It's a little bit more granular. And actually what, what's happening here is this is a little bit more adipose tissue, um, a, a little bit more of a fatty, fattier muscle. A lot more fat will show up uh, more hyperechoic like this. Um, and this is why a lot of people, I think, get really frustrated with the bow tie is because they'll see this, but this will just look like schmutz. Well, this here is your sartorius muscle. And the cool thing about the sartorius muscle is it always sits right on top of the iliacus muscle and no adipose tissue accumulates between this fascia layer. Okay, that's a really cool um, ultrasonographic finding that is consistent regardless of your patient's body habits. It is always, always, always going to be like this, where the sartorius sits right on the iliacus muscle with no adipose tissue in between, versus the internal oblique, which is normally a little bit more of a fattier muscle anyway, and then you can get this accumulation of fat underneath the internal oblique and makes it look like this, makes it look really schmutzy. So 95% of our patients, this is what you're gonna see. It's gonna look just like this, okay? And I don't care if you're a bodybuilder or not, you're always gonna have some amount of adipose tissue accumulation here. And this is why this is not gonna look the same. As a matter of fact, this image comes off of a patient who was 32 years old and a BMI of 28. So clearly not a big patient, but you can see the discrepancy and the difference here um, on, the, on the, the muscles, okay? This is a muscle but a lot more adipose tissue versus this, which is not so much so, okay? This is actually one of my most favorite images of, of all my collection. And the reason why this is one of my favorite images is because uh, when I was deployed to Fort Hood many years ago, I taught them how to do fascia liaca blocks. And this was actually a picture <laughs> that someone sent me, one of the soldiers sent me after I taught them and I had, and I had left and they said, is this right? Is this the right? Am I doing this right? Am I putting the local anesthetic in the right spot? And I saved this and I put this in my slides because the answer is yes, it is. And you can see here, they put their needle through the sartorius. This is the sartorius muscle right here on the left. And on the right, this is the internal oblique. But the key is, is they got underneath the fascia iliaca. A lot of times when you do this block, you'll see this, this, um, we call it speculation. Uh, it looks very, it looks, you know, like a lot of, it, a lot of people might think it's muscle and they're inside the muscle. But what's really happening here is this is actually connective tissue because the fascia iliaca sits on top of the iliacus muscle. Well, when you put local anesthetic in between the, the fascia and the muscle, the, there's still connective tissue there. And so that's what this is. This is just a little bit of connective tissue connecting the muscle to the uh, fascia iliaca. And so when it separates, you get a little bit of this going on. All right, I'm gonna go back just to this slide because one thing I, I like to tell people is, a lot of people ask, well, how far up should I go? A lot of times you'll see these vessels. These are called the deep circumflex iliac uh, um, arteries or, and vessels that are, that are here underneath the internal oblique. I'll usually put my needle up to where, where those um, uh, vessels are, just right underneath them. And that's where I stop. And I start my infiltration, and then maybe when I have 10 more cc's left to go, I'll slowly back my needle up as I'm injecting as I come out. Okay, uh, so this is, uh, this is actually after they've done that, this is all local anesthetic, and they're actually backing up, and you can see local anesthetic going over top of the internal oblique. This is exactly how that goes. So what we're going to do now is we're going to scan um, the fascia iliaca, and I'm going to kind of show you how to scan that, okay? So... Let's come here and let me get uh, let me get this ready, just like that. Very good. Okay. So, so we talked about home base. Um, home base for this is going to be the femoral nerve block. Okay. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to I'm going to put the probe right here in the inguinal crease, which is right there. And very nice. So you can see uh, pumping artery. Okay. Looks really good. And then just lateral to that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this real quick. So here's my artery here. This is my, um, this is my femoral, um, uh, femoral nerve right here. And if I start scanning laterally, I'll start seeing this. This is my sartorius muscle, okay? You see that little wedge right there? That's my sartorius muscle. Now, one big pitfall to this block 
is uh, some people will be too cephalad. If you're too cephalad, your sartorius muscle goes away. And I'm going to show you that right now. So I'm going to scan cephalad. Now look, if I go medial, I can still see my artery. I can see it, still see my nerve. But when I go lateral, look, I don't see, I don't see the, the muscle at all. And the reason why is because the sartorius muscle attaches to the ASIS, which is what I'm pointing to right here. Okay. And because it attaches there, if I'm, to, if I'm above it, I'm never going to see it. So I, I want to make sure I'm in the inguinal crease when I do it. And I'm going to scan lateral. Oh, let me go a little bit more cut out. There we go. So I'm going to scan lateral until I see my sartorius muscle, which I see it right here, kind of po poking out. Whoops. Sorry. Right there. I'm seeing it right there. Now from there, all I'm going to do is I'm just going to rotate my probe until now it's pointing towards the umbilicus. Okay. So here you can see my uh, sartorius muscle here. We can clearly see some uh, vessels here. Now up here, notice the difference. So this looks a little bit more schmutzy than this. This is, this is normal. Okay. So this is actually my bow tie sign. So this is my sartorius here. This is my deep circumflex iliac vessel, which is right there. I'm going to move this um, arrow out of the way, but that is, classic bow tie uh, sign. And then where I would put my needle is I'd go right here, okay? What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna track my needle um, uh, caudad to cephalad, uh, so superior medially, okay? So basically my needle is, is aiming up towards the um, umbilicus. Now, if I go back here to this image, this right here, this line is my fascia iliaca, okay? So I'm going to try to go through the tip of the sartorius underneath it, but just on top of it, this iliacus muscle. Once I start, uh, once I get my needle there, I start my infiltration, and the, the iliacus muscle will drop, and then I'll just advance my needle superiorly until I get to about right here, underneath those circumflex vessels. Now, once you get there and you've started infiltrating, you're going to see that iliacus muscle start dropping, okay? Uh, and, and opening up with all the local anesthetic. And then you'll see the local anesthetic keep going up um, cephalad, okay, up here into the iliac fossa. And it'll just keep diving down in there. One cool thing you can do, and I'd recommend you doing after you've done this block, is go back to home base, okay? Go back to home base and find your femoral nerve. Because if you've done this block correctly, um, you'll see your femoral nerve floating in a bath of local anesthetic, okay, because it's underneath the fascia iliaca, okay. Uh, one question I always get is, well, why don't I just do a really lateral femoral block? It's a lot easier. Um, that's the question I always get. And, and it's true, it is easier because, again, finding home base is pretty easy. So what people say is like, okay, well, I have my artery here. I have my nerve here. Well, why don't I just put my needle right here and then just go there? Will that work? And the answer is yes, it probably will work. But one of the beauties of doing the bow tie sign is I'm directing my local anesthetic superiorly. And the reason why that's important is because there's a lot of little articular branches that come off of the femoral nerve and they dive deep into the hip. And when you, um, when you push it up, uh, cephalad into the iliac fossa, it's gonna get those nerves. Whereas when you put it right here laterally, it may or may not go up into up uh, cephalad to, in order to get that, okay? So that is why um, I advocate doing the bow tie sign. Once I get the sartorius, I rotate around, and there we go. I see my sartorius here on the left. I see my internal oblique on the right, and then I can just go up um, underneath the probe uh, in plane, going this way with my needle, and then um, I'll put it, show it on the ultrasound here. Go through the tip of the sartorius, make sure you get under the fascia iliaca, just on top of the muscle, and then push my local anesthetic um, uh, superior medially um, towards the umbilicus. All right, and that's going to get all those, all those nerves. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to switch gears just a little bit, and we're going to go over uh, pain blocks, all right, and which is kind of the new in vogue block. Everybody likes hearing about it. Everybody likes talking about it, um, and it's a real fun block to do. So Peng block actually was invented by a guy named, um, uh, by Dr. Peng, Philip Peng is actually his name, and back in 2018, kind of described the anatomy of this. Um, and so it's, it's referred to as the pericapsular nerve group, or pericapsular end nerve group is another way 
I've uh, heard it uh, being said. Uh, but the key of this is it gets these articular branches of the femoral and the obturator nerve. We talked a little bit about the obturator nerve before when we were talking about the uh, fascia iliaca block, but we're going to talk a little bit about more about it here again. Now, I'm, as I mentioned, I'm going back to this um, image that I uh, showed you about hip, hip fractures. Okay. Now, if you're doing a hip arthroplasty, um, it's, it's going to be fine to use either a fascia iliaca or a pain block, but here, for, for hip fractures, it's going to be really important that the fracture is either one of these two. It's either a femoral neck or an intratrochanteric fracture. If it's a subtrochanteric fracture, a pain block is not going to work. And the reason why it's not going to work is because what we're blocking are the articular branches of the obturator and the femoral nerve. And they terminate on the greater trochanter. Okay, They don't really go past the greater trochanter a whole lot. So if I have a, a subtrochanteric fracture, um, those nerves are going to be uh, inner th that that fracture and that part of the femur is going to be innervated by branches of the femoral nerve that come off a little bit more uh, distally. All right, whereas the ones we're getting here are ones that have broken off from the femoral nerve a lot more proximal. Okay, um, but so for a pain block, uh, femoral neck fractures, intratrochanteric. Um, uh, fractures are going to be very beneficial and hip arthroplasties also going to be very beneficial. Another um, surgical procedure that would benefit from this would also be acetabular fractures. And let me go to this next image and we can kind of show you this a little bit. So here you can actually see where these branches are. This is actually a little die study showing uh, where the uh, where the die is once you do a pain block as it kind of runs off down here over the top of the this is the pelvic uh, the pelvic brim also known as the uh, uh, pubic eminence, which is right here. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But, um, but that's where these little branches go right over the top of the iliopubic eminence, and they dive here into the hip capsule right there. Um, and so if you have an acetabular fracture, it's right there. You can, you know, you know, you can reliably get a lot of those nerves that are innervating the acetabulum. Uh, but these nerves terminate right here on the greater trochanter, and they don't go any further than that. So um, doing a pain block for a femoral nail is not going to be very beneficial. Doing a, a pain block for a hip arthroplasty can be very beneficial because they're just going to be locking off the head of this uh, where the greater trochanter is putting in a new hardware, and then, uh, and then the patient's good to go. So this is kind of what the anatomy, the sono anatomy looks like when we're doing this. Um, now, I talk again a lot about home base, and home base is the same for fascia iliaca as it is for pain block, and that is to go to the femoral nerve block. In fact, indeed, here you can see that home base right, right here. We have the femoral artery, and then we have the femoral nerve, okay? And just deep to that, you see this nice, white, hyperchoic, continuous white line. It almost looks like a roller coaster, right? It kind of comes down, it comes up, it goes down, it comes up again, and it goes down and up again. So this first little hump that's right underneath the artery is called the iliopubic eminence, okay? Uh, this is the iliopsoas uh, notch. We've called this the trough of Schwartz, though, uh, from a, a fellow colleague of mine. If he's listening, he's going to get a nice laugh out of this. But this next big hump right here is called the AIIS, the anterior inferior iliac spine. Now, if I were to keep going lateral, you'd see another hump way up here, which is the ASIS, which is again, where the sartorius muscle attaches. But the big one that we're looking for is this one right here, the AIIS, the anterior inferior iliac spine. Um, and to get this image, again, you start at home base, but really all you need to do, once you get to home base, you need to get your depth right, where you are seeing a bony structure, okay? If you're seeing a white hyperchoic structure, you're in a good spot from home base. Now, usually if you're caudad enough, like I was talking to you about for a fascia iliaca block, you will see a bony structure. But a lot of the time, you'll see two white lines that are kind of curved. And I'll show you that when we scan here in a minute. If you see that, what that is, is that's the actual hip joint and the acetabulum, okay? So that means you're a little too caudad. at. So I will move the probe a little bit more cephalide until I see one white line 
And then it's all about angling the probe. Usually it's obliquing the probe just a little bit. And I'll show you that when I scan how that looks. And the key is you want to try and get your probe in an area where you're seeing one continuous um, white line like this, okay? Um, because this the, the pelvic brim or the iliopubic eminence area, it's, it's, think of it as a shelf. It's a pretty narrow shelf. If you're too cephalad, you're off the shelf and you're diving into the pelvis. If you're too caudad, you're into the actual hip joint. You're seeing the acetabulum and the and the hip and the femoral uh, hip bone going into the into the acetabulum. And so it's a pretty narrow shelf. That's about a shelf that's about uh, two centimeters um, wide. And so you have kind of two centimeters to see this a nice continuous white line. So here's a nice little cartoon of this. Um, there's been some debate about location of spread of local anesthetic or or better said location of needle insertion okay um in this image this is kind of the classic way of doing it which is putting the lo uh, local anesthetic lateral to the psoas tendon and we'll show you the psoas tendon here in a minute um and then seeing local anesthetic lift up the psoas tendon now one uh warning i'm going to tell you is uh, about this is usually this space is very tight so even when i get in that space and i I touch the bone and right where I need it to go. Um, and you start injecting, your injector person is gonna be like, I can't inject anything, it's really tight. And sometimes it can be really tight and you have to kind of finagle it a little bit. I kind of do this little corkscrew technique to try to get it through the fascia that's covering the, the iliopsoas notch here and then um, and then get it underneath the, the psoas tendon. Um, and then you want this local anesthetic to kind of go this way and that way. Now, lateral here, where the AIIS is, this is where all of those articular branches of the femoral nerve are going to be. Medial to the psoas tendon is where the articular branches of the obturator nerve are going to be, okay? And so it's important to see spread on both sides if you can. Another option is, is going over the top of the psoas tendon and hitting the IPE, the iliopubic eminence, and then you'll see the local anesthetic go underneath the psoas tendon, okay? Um, when, we, when we scan here in a minute, a lot of times you'll see this uh, interfascial layer in between the iliopsoas muscle, okay? Um, that can throw a lot of people off. Usually it's very hyperechoic, and a lot of people think this is the psoas tendon. Uh, usually scanning up and down a little bit, you'll see that it's not, and this is actually this nice round structure. Sometimes this can look like a crescent, and it looks like it's a psoas tendon, but that's kind of throwing people off a little bit. The last thing I want to talk to you about is we one of the benefits of a peng block is the fact that you can cause femoral nerve sparing. Okay, so that you know you can do this is a great block for hip arthroplasties because I can do this block, it's very effective at controlling pain, but I don't get the motor component associated with a fascial yaka block. Okay, I'm missing the femoral nerve, or rather stated, I'm missing the motor nerve components of the femoral nerve. I'm still getting articular branches of the femoral nerve, which are down here, which are diving in and innervating the bone, but I'm missing the motor component. So that's great from a, from a, um, a motor post-op uh, physical therapy standpoint. I just want to give you a word of caution, though. Um, when you do this block, can you get motor weakness? And the answer is actually yes. And how we did a cadaver study about this um, uh, not too long ago, and uh, we we inadvertently we did this block and it looked beautiful, everything looked great, and we did it under fluoro and and we put dye in there and then we in these cadavers and then we dissected them, and lo and behold, we saw staining of local anesthetic on one of our blocks of the femoral nerve, and we were just head scratching. Why did that happen? Why did we get staining of the femoral nerve and what we found out was um, we were not underneath the fascia that was covering this muscle if you think of this muscle kind of like um, a sausage and a sausage casing right so if you put your local anesthetic in between the sausage and the casing that local anesthetic is going to wrap around that sausage casing okay and that is how it's going to get the femoral nerve okay and that's what happened because we were not through and through the sausage casing on the other side uh, between the bone and the fascia um, we were getting the femoral nerve so it's really important that you put your local anesthetic uh, in between the bone and the fascia because 
If you don't, you can actually have that local anesthetic go all the way around the iliopsoas muscle and inadvertently get the femoral nerve. Um, so there have been some reported cases in literature about uh, you know quad weakness from a pain block and everybody's scratching their head. Well, this is why it's happening. It's because you're not deep enough, you're not under the fascia covering the iliopsoas muscle. You're in, you're in between the fascia and the muscle itself. So you need to be between the, the bone and the fascia so that that doesn't happen, okay? So this is a great image kind of showing that. So where D is here, this is the area we're looking at. And here's the AIIS, here's the, here's the psoas tendon, here's the IPE, this is home base, um, femoral artery, femoral nerve right there. And then notice, this is what I want you to notice in this image. Notice how the probe is oriented. See how oblique it is? So you need to oblique it like how this line in D is, okay? A lot of, when you're doing a classic uh, femoral block, it's not as oblique usually. So this is what you kind of have to uh, finagle a little bit when you're doing this. Now I'm gonna go to a video that I made uh, that's gonna show two different ways of doing a pain block. And I want you to particularly notice uh, the very last one, what I did initially with the local anesthetic. In this video, a left-sided pain block is being performed. Local anesthetic was initially injected on the lateral aspect of the psoas tendon. The needle was retracted back and later moved to the medial aspect of the psoas tendon until the needle contacts the iliopubic eminence. You can see local anesthetic being injected there and the local anesthetic spreads medially underneath the femoral artery. In this video, another left-sided pain block is being performed. The needle is moved to the lateral aspect of the psoas tendon until it contacts the iliopubic eminence. At this point, local anesthetic is injected. Initially, you can see local anesthetic being injected above the fascial plane just to the lateral aspect of the psoas tendon. Later, the needle is advanced and you can now see local anesthetic being injected underneath the psoas tendon moving medially. Okay, so that last video, as I kind of explained to you guys about that sausage, uh, you know, technique, um, the, the, the local anesthetic initially, and you could appreciate that, the local anesthetic initially was um, kind of in the muscle or in between the muscle and the fascia. And so I had to advance my needle further to get underneath that fascia. And then when you, when you saw that, you saw that local anesthetic spreading just right in between the bone and the fascia. That's, that's what you need to see. That's the money for uh for this block it's very important that you see that when you uh when you do a uh, pain block otherwise again like i was saying you can get uh femoral nerve uh blocking and and, and that's how it happens um, a lot of people haven't figured out why that happens well now you know that's that's the explanation for it so let me show you how to scan for a pain block okay so uh all right here we go so let, let's go to a classic uh classic uh, approach here okay and then uh this is this is right in the inguinal crease all right so you can see my artery and you can see my nerve right there now look i i said one of the things you need to do is you need to go deeper so i'm going to go one deeper until i see a bone and sure enough i see uh oh, let me go back to this there we go i see a bone now i was telling you if you see two white lines it's because you're too caudad and so this is actually the, the, the head of the femur, <laughs> all right? So all you need to do is go a little bit cephalad and look what I did. I went cephalad, now I just see one line here. It kind of dies off here. So all I'm gonna do is oblique it a little bit and look at that. I just obliqued it a little bit and I just kind of did a little adjustment and sure enough, I see this nice white continuous line, okay? So this up at the top here, this is the AIIS or the anterior inferior iliac spine. I can see my femoral nerve right here. I can see my artery. Now this I actually want to talk about. So see, you see some hyperechoicity here. That little crescent I was telling you about is that interfascia. And I see this little, this, this little kind of round circular thing here, but I also see a round circular thing here. So if you kind of scan up and down just a little bit, you can appreciate what is 
so is tendon. And actually, I think this right here where my arrow is, that is actually the so is tendon. Yep. So I'm just kind of scanning up and down a little bit. And this, see how this kind of dies away? This is actually all intermuscle fascia, this little line right there. So this is kind of messed up a lot of people. A lot of people think this is the psoas tendon, but in reality here, it's actually right here. So what you can do is you can come down here with your needle and then put your local anesthetic right there and try to lift up that psoas tendon. Um, don't try to go through the psoas tendon. A lot of people will try to get through the psoas tendon. The psoas tendon, when you, when you hit it with a needle, it will feel like a rock and you will not be able to drive a blunt block needle through the psoas tendon. It's going to be nigh to impossible. Not only that, you probably shouldn't do it anyway because that can actually cause some tendonitis if you do that. So you either want to go um, on the lateral aspect of it or the medial aspect of it, maybe hit the IPE here. So this is where you would go on the medial aspect of it. Again, if you only see medial spread, you're probably only going to get a lot of the obturator nerve component, which is right here. On this lateral aspect here, this is actually where all the femoral nerve components are going to be. So this is, let me go back and scan it again. So this right here is um, home base. Um, looks great. Looks, I can see the artery. I'm clearly deep enough because I see some white structure. And that's all you need to do. You go from home base, just go deep enough until you see a white structure. In this case, I see a white structure, but I see two of them. So that means I'm too caught at because this is actually my hip right there. This is actually the acetabulum. So I'm going to go north until I don't see until I don't see two lines. Now I only see one white line, but it's not continuous. So all from all I'm going to do from there is I'm just going to oblique it a little bit. And look, once I oblique it a little bit, I can see if I go lateral, I can see the AIIS. If I keep going more lateral, this is actually the AASIS. You can see way up here in the top left. This is the AIIS right here. You see the this uh, nice, um, it's almost like a ski jump here, roller coaster going all the way down here. And then medial, you see the IPE, okay? Um, so, so that is how you would scan a ping block. Now, where do you go with your needle? So my needle, I'm gonna go, um, I'm going to go lateral to medial, okay? Just right here, just like I would do a, a just like I would do a, a a femoral nerve block, and I would just go underneath in plane, underneath my probe, and uh, ideally I would go here lateral to the psoas tendon and inject underneath the psoas tendon and try to lift it up, okay? Uh, making sure that I'm not inside the muscle because if I'm inside the muscle, local anesthetic can track around that muscle and get to my femoral nerve, which is right there. But if I'm below the muscle, um, or below the fascia rather, in between the fascia and the bone, it's gonna stay in that nice plane where those articular uh, branches of the femoral and the obturator nerve live, okay? And if I do that, it's gonna be a really great block. Um, another cool feature about this block I'm just gonna tell you is it usually lasts a long time. Because it's such a tight space, um, that local anesthetic will just kind of hang out there. So even if you use, for example, say ropivacaine, okay, um, I've seen that block lasting almost a day and a half, uh, and it just kind of stays there, all right? Uh, the last thing I'm gonna tell you about is if you are doing a ant anterior hip, all right, this block will work for anterior and for lateral hip uh, arthroplasties. I know the new invoke thing is to do anterior hips, and so, um, if you do anterior hip, you'll probably miss the incision. So what you can do is you can ask your surgeon to just infiltrate the incisional pain, um, just the, where the incision is, and that will get the incisional pain. If you're doing lateral hips, you may need to combine a lateral femoral cutaneous nerve block with like five to eight cc's, sometimes 10 cc's of local anesthetic uh, for that. The other thing I didn't tell you is how much local anesthetic to put in there. So you can put uh, 20 to 30 cc's. Most, uh, most of the studies is actually just 20 cc's of local anesthetic. So if you have, if you're using ropivacaine or bupivacaine, you could use 0.5%, 20 cc's of 0.5% um, ropivacaine or bupivacaine. And then uh, you can use the 10 cc's if you're doing a lateral hip to put um, and get the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. So let me go back to the slides because this is very important to always keep calm and just do a regional anesthetic. So with that, what we're gonna do is we're gonna turn to any questions that we have. And this, well, this is really good. All right, so we, 
It was 45 minutes, so we have 15 minutes to go over any questions that anybody might have. I think um, I think you just write, type them in if I if I remember right, That's and then um, Lara will moderate. Yeah, we have a couple of questions already, Dr. Teams. Uh, right. First question: Can you use a continuous catheter with a fascia iliaca for pain, or what about lupizumol or bupivacaine? A lupizumol bupivacaine? Yeah. Yes. So um, so yes, you can. So you can use. Uh, catheter techniques for this. Um, I actually have a really funny story about using a catheter with a fascia iliaca. I did for a hip fracture. Um, we put a, a fascia iliaca uh, a catheter in, and uh, I, I summarily got called by the uh, radiologist. I'm like, who calls anesthesia? What, what radiologist has ever called anesthesia? Like that never happens. Well, they called me and they said, hey, you, you put the catheter inside the, the peritoneal cavity. And I'm like, mm, don't think I did. Uh, but they said, oh, yes, you did. So I'm like, all right, where's your dark room? So I went down to the dark room and, and they pulled up the CT scan. And knowing what we talked about today, where the local anesthetic is going into the iliac fossa, um, that catheter was laying inside the iliac fossa, but in uh, between the iliac fossa and the bottom part of the perineum or the pelvis is. And so I showed that to him and he could see the local anesthetic there, the fluid collection under there. He thought it was in the pelvis, but then you look and you slice the CT scan, you can clearly see the bottom of the peritoneum. So it was in the iliac fossa, but it, but but underneath the peritoneum. So uh, right where it needed to be. So it was right, it was right where you need to do. So the answer is yes, you can use catheters for this. Um, as far as pain blocks, pain blocks is, are, um, is considered a, a fascial plane block. And so it is considered on label use for liposomal bupivacaine. Uh, fascia iliaca uh, technically is a little in the gray area, although I actually did a, a little mini study to, to test between what, using it for liposomal bupivacaine, and it works uh, really well uh, for fascia iliaca, but I don't think technically it's on label for that. Um, but, uh, but you can use both uh, modalities for, for these blocks. Great, and uh, kind of a clarifying question on, on that topic. What about ideal location for a fascia iliac catheter is near the deep circumflex iliac vessels? Question? Yes, so that's where I would drop it off. So I would use my local anesthetic to open it. Again, you wanna use a lot of volume, so I'll use like 50 cc's, uh, open it up, and then I'll thread my catheter into that, that space. And usually, again, I'll have my catheter tip right where the deep circumflex iliac artery is, and then I'll just thread it, and it's going to thread down um, that ramp down into the iliac fossa, and that's where I thread it, and uh, and that's where I leave it. Yeah, so uh, fascia iliac catheters, I mean, they, they don't ever really get dislodged because it's in such a deep kind of goalie, you know, uh, and it's threaded way down in there, um, and so um, that's, that's where you put it. Okay, great. Um, what tips do you have for fascia iliaca and pain on patients who have round, firm abdominal regions? Who have round, firm abdominal, did I hear that right? Round, yes. firm abdominal regions? Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, we like to, I'm, I'm here in Texas, so we like to call them Texas small pa people. So um, I think, I think I'm picking up what you're putting down. Um, but yes, that is, that is a, that can be a problem. So, um, and, and I'm actually glad you brought that up because one of the, when I do my workshops, one of the things I talk about is to not be a panis peeker. You don't want to be a panis peeker when you're scanning this. And what I mean by that is um, you don't want to use your probe and you, you want to be, you want your probe like this. Oh, well, here, I'll show you like that. You want your probe like this. Okay. Very parallel to the, to the ground. What a lot of people do is if someone has a big panis here, what they want to do is they want to do this. They want to try to peek underneath the panis, okay? Well, if you do that, it's going to distort your sono anatomy. So the best thing to do, one, there's two things. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Number one is you want your patient completely flat because if they're sitting up a little bit, that panis is going to kind of flop in your way. So you don't want that. Number two is you either need someone to kind of retract up a little bit, or if you're scanning, if you, if I scan with my left hand and I, I've done this a lot. So um, if you're scanning with your left hand, I use my left hand to kind of hold the panis up. Mm -hmm. So my the panis is right here. So I kind of hold it up like this. And then with my right hand, I'm going to drive it in there. Mm -hmm. um, all that so that you can keep your ultrasound probe 
nice, nice and flat. Okay, that's a great question because it, it, it does pose a big challenge for fascia iliaca, especially with patients that um, are in shape. You know, round is a shape, so <laughs> you know, <laughs> right? That 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 can be that can be a little challenging. I I totally get it. But those are those are two uh, key te techniques. So don't be labeled a panis speaker. Okay, just take that home. Got it. <laughs> um, Great is question. The, is the QL block effective for hip arthroplasty analgesia? Oh, that is a good question. Um, so the it's a little complicated of a thing. Well, I'm going to uncomplicate it. Uh, the, the short answer is yes and maybe. Um, so it depends. Um, QL3 blocks, which for all intents and purposes, a QL3 block is basically a lateral, slightly lateral uh, lumbar plexus block. And we know lumbar plexus block from literature are good for getting the lumbar plexus, which those same nerves are going down and getting into the hip capsule. So yes, a QL3 block is good, and there's actually good literature to support QL3 blocks for, um, for uh, hip fractures. So to clarify what a QL3 block is, that local anesthetic you're depositing between the psoas muscle and the, um, and the quadratus lumborum muscle, mm -hmm. okay? That is a QL3 block. Now, will a QL1 block or a QL2 block work for uh, hip fractures or for hip arthroplasties or, or the like? Um, and the answer is, is mm, maybe, and that's where that maybe comes from. Um, I do a lot of QL2 blocks, and I would say, I, well, I've only had two patients that have had non-clinically significant quad weakness. So that should tell you something right there, right? So if I'm getting most of my patients with a QL2 block are not getting quad weakness, that means I don't, I'm not getting a high concentration of local anesthetic around all of the lumbar plexus to probably be effective for a, um, for a hip uh, fracture. Whereas a QL3 block, most of the time you're going to get quad weakness because you're right there by the lumbar plexus. So hopefully that uncomplicates it a little bit for you. But so that, that's the, that's the short answer. Okay. Hopefully that was helpful. That sounds great. Um, can a perfectly done ping block make a zero for zero out of 10 pain for patients? <laughs> yeah, that's a hard question. Well, it depends how many psych, psych meds is this patient on? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, so, uh, that's a, that's an interestingly worded question. Um, so it depends, um, for plain arthroplasties where they're not messing with the acetabulum, yeah, you can get really, really good analgesia. Um, if you're doing, it, it's, it's a little comp more complicated than that, right? Because, you know, if you're doing a lateral hip, okay, we do need to make sure we're getting that lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. Because if I do a pain block, that's great. For a hip arthroplasty, that's great. Maybe I'm getting all the pain for the hip arthroplasty, but the patient's still 10 out of 10 because their lateral hip and their incision hurts. Well, so so that that's that's a little complicating. If um, if they're reaming the acetabulum and putting a whole new socket in, right, um, then they may have some posterior pain, which comes off of the sciatic nerve. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a very small amount, uh, but there is still some there, which clearly we're not getting when we're doing a pain block. Uh, so uh, usually the patients are a little uncomfortable in there. I wouldn't say it's like a deep throbbing pain. It's just kind of a dull, achy pain. Uh, when they when they ream the acetabulum and you're doing a pain block, if they're just doing a uh, you know just the the proximal hip or whatever and it's not that 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 big a deal, then or or if they're just putting a nail in through the greater trochanter or or by the uh, uh, the femoral neck just to you know nail it all together, yeah, those patients do extremely well. By and large, they do very well with the pain blocks. I, I've been very uh, impressed with the analgesia I get off it. So. Um, you kind of set me up for failure on that question. Zero you know, <laughs> am I going to get a zero out of ten? <laughs> yeah. Gosh, yeah. So just uh, just find out how many um, psych meds are on. You'll know. Right. <laughs> um, what about the relationship of the pain block to the ureter? Is there a risk of injury? <laughs> yeah. So I've actually seen that in in literature too. Um, if you go on if you go on the YouTube's, you know, there's going to be some pretty awesome videos about all these blocks, right? Um, 
gosh, one of my favorite is Peck Blocks. Oh my gosh, go, go on to YouTube and find the videos on Peck Blocks and um, don't actually, please don't do that because there's some really crazy ludicrous stuff on there about that. But one of the things that's on there about, about Peng Blocks is getting the ureter. Well, so if you, if you look at the anatomy, there, there's actually this, this, and I know where the, this question is coming from. There, there was a u ureteral injury and they claimed it on the, on the Peng Block. Well, if you, if you know, understand where the ureters are coming in and attaching to the bladder, it's actually a lot more posterior. And then they come in and then they go through the UV junction and they dive into the bladder. Um, so either one of two things happen. One is, is the person who is doing this pain block just really got lost and was not looking at the anatomy and not looking at the bone um, and somehow got the ureter, which I don't know how they did it. Or they did a medial to lateral approach as opposed to the lateral to medial approach and they dove into the pelvis. Um, yeah, you could probably bag the ureter. Very unlikely. Or the other likely thing is, is the surgeon got it, right? When they were kind of uh, doing whatever they were doing. If they're doing an anterior hip, maybe something happened. But um, but yeah, it's, uh, yeah, as long as you see the iliopubic eminence and that one continuous white line and you're going down to it, the ureter is a lot more posterior than that in the pelvis. You're not going to get it. Um, and that's why it's also important, I think, going lateral to medial as, a, if, as opposed to going medial to lateral. I don't know why you would ever do that, but um, I, would, I would not advocate for that. Okay, got it. Um, and I'm not quite sure what this question is aiming at, uh, but I'll just read it exactly as it says. What is the LA and volume amount you like for your ping blocks for TKA? Okay, so local anesthetic volume amounts for uh, uh, to TKA, total knee arthroplasties? Uh, yeah, I guess so. Um, well, I wouldn't do I wouldn't do a pain block for a TKA. Okay. Um, I would only do it for a hip. So a TAH, oh, total T -H -A. T -H -A, yeah, total hip yeah. arthroplasty. Yes. Okay. Makes, yeah. Okay. So for that, uh, great question. So um, for the pain block, I would do twenty cc's in as a pain block, like we just described it. And at our hospital, we we do a lot of lateral hips. So I'd take that other. Um, 10 cc's and I do a lateral femoral cutaneous nerve block in addition to that. Mm -hmm. So uh, so 20 cc's, again, like I was saying, that that space is very tight. So 20 cc's is gonna go a long way. Mm -hmm. um, could you do 30 cc's? Yes. Have I done 30 cc's in the past? Yes. Um, but after doing a cadaver study on that, I think 20 cc's is plenty because um, what was cool in the cadaver thing, when once we went down and looked at the dye, um, it dove all the way down into the back of the iliac fossa underneath the, that iliopsoas muscle, all the way down there. 20 cc's was all we used, and uh, and it really got back there quite a bit and just bathed the whole thing in in dye and local anesthetic. So, uh, so yeah, 20 cc's is really all you need for this um, because the, the space is so tight. Right. Okay, we have two Good more questions. questions. I know we're at the top of the hour, so I'm hoping to squeeze these last two questions in. Okay. Um, would a FI block or a pain block be better for hip arthroscopy if you had to choose? Which is hip better? arthroscopy? Um, well, for hip, uh, that's a that's a good question. So hip arthroscopies, uh, a lot of that, a lot of the the pain is going to be a lot more superficial because it's basically the scopes and the, the 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 stuff. They're not doing a lot of stuff on the bone. So I'd probably lean more towards the fascia iliaca because because of that. Um, maybe very dilute because again I probably don't want to bag the bag the, the femoral nerve. And if I do, I just don't want it, the, the motor component to last very long. So hip or hip uh, arthroscopes are not very painful because they're not really doing a lot with the bone per se. So it's a little bit more um, superficial stuff. So I'd I'd probably go with the fascia iliaca with a lot more dilute uh, local anesthetic. Okay, great. And where do you leave the tip of the catheter in continuous pain block and at what rate of infusion? Yeah, so um, great question. So where you could leave it is just, I, I would, again, I put my local or my needle right at the crux of where the psoas tendon is, and I just kind of leave it right there. So it kind of sits underneath the psoas tendon if I can. Um, and then, um, you know, so it's underneath the psoas tendon or by it, uh, one or two centimeters. And then because it's a tight, space you don't need it run it at a, at a high rate so um you know six to eight cc's an hour is really all you would need in order to to to, to cause it you know to make it be efficacious so 
Okay. And I'm, yeah. I'm going to squeeze one more in because we talked about this before we started, just the, the couple of us on the call um, earlier, for an elderly hip fracture patient, what sedation would you use, if any, to perform an FI or pain block for pain control prior to surgery? Oh, that's actually, you know, you know, that was one thing we actually didn't talk about. Um, so this block, um, I, I do when, I, or you can do when they're completely asleep. Um, but you can also do when they're awake too. So I've done these blocks. Um, we, we have a hip fracture protocol at our hospital. So a lot of times they, you know, you know, grandma falls and breaks her hip. Uh, we get a consult within a couple hours and we'll do one of these blocks for, um, for the for the for the patient we might do a single shot at that time sometimes we'll do a catheter it just depends um and and clearly they're awake when they're doing that but i've also done this when they're asleep under anesthesia so they go in they get their hip done they um we're at the end of the case and then i get called hey we're done with the we're done with the case and then i'll do it when they're when they're asleep um and the reason why it's okay is because you know it, they're plain blocks i'm not targeting a specific nerve with my needle i'm not you know, I'm not going to shish kebab and, uh, uh, a nerve with my needle based on this anatomy if you do this approach uh, versus doing like an interscanning super cloud. I would do them with, with them awake. Um, but these ones I can do when they're uh, when they're fully asleep. Uh, Pang and fascia the yaka, I've done them that way because I'm putting it in a fascial plane, just like I do QL blocks when they're asleep, PEX blocks I do when they're asleep, TAP blocks you can do when they're asleep. Um, but you can also do them when they're awake too. Now, as far as sedation, you know, that's up to you. Um, because it's a plain block, I'm okay sedating them because I'm not worried about checking to see what their paresthesias are, like I would be for like an interscanning or a super clab. Mm -hmm. So if you want to gork them out on bursad and fentanyl, go right ahead, you know, just make sure they don't get apnea. <laughs> right, right. Um, we still have a couple more questions. I mean, do you have a few more minutes or do you want me to, we can take Sure, I mean, if people, are people still listening to me right now? This yeah, is great. We still got quite a few people on. This is pretty great. Um, any experience doing an FI for hip fracture surgical anesthesia without spinal or GA? Okay, um, so actually I didn't go over this in my slide. It was in my slide, but um, I didn't mention it. So fasciliaca is a good um, analgesia block, but it's not gonna cause complete anesthesia, okay? Uh, meaning I, I can't really do a surgical fasciliaca block. Uh, likewise, I can't really do a surgical pain block. I'm sure somewhere, someplace in, you know, Tibet, maybe they've done that. But as far as I know, I've, I've never done that because again, the reliability of obturator is, is really hard to, to get. Plus again, if they're doing stuff with the acetabulum, you're going to miss it. So, uh, so it's going to cause good analgesia to that area, but it's not going to cause complete anesthesia, meaning it's not going to be a fascia, um, uh, a surgical block. Likewise, I mentioned that it is a volume block. So, you know, when I do my surgical blocks, I'll use, you know, 2% mepivacaine or 2% lidocaine because it causes a dense, really super dense block. Um, and, you know, if I do 20 cc's of 2% mepivacaine, well, that's not enough volume to really get all of what I need up in the fascia of the octa. So, so good, anal yeah, good analgesia, not perfect surgical anesthesia. Got it. Okay. Okay, great. Well, I mean, we're past the hour, so I really want to be respectful of your time, but thank you so much, Dr. Teams. I've learned a ton on this webinar. This was, this was exceptional content, and I think everyone will agree. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your time, and um, we will definitely do some more work together, I'm sure. Thank you all so much. Thanks for being here. Thank you, everyone, for joining us.